uh, panelists, guests, um, uh, and all of you who, uh, who registered to be here today. People have come from uh, a lot of different places. We even have uh, two panelists, guest panelists from Australia, and they've, in a sense, come from the future because it's tomorrow morning there already for them. Um, so I just want to uh, begin basically with the land acknowledgement, but I want to put that into a context to make it more meaningful, okay? Last Thursday, uh, September the 30th, was the first ever National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, a federal statutory holiday formed as part of the 94 calls to action by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. In the spirit of reconciliation, I want to begin by stating that while I am speaking from Guelph, Ontario, this uh, is officially a Wilfrid Laurier event uh, taking place in Waterloo, Ontario, officially. Therefore, um, the land acknowledgement I would use is uh, to say that we acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and neutral peoples. But as my colleague Eric Foxtree, who's here right now, uh, reminded me, we are also always speaking from unceded territory. In fact, if you're someone with my background, white settler colonial, colonialist, and so on, you are pretty much always speaking from a position or a place that doesn't belong to you in some essential sense, where the very notion of the land belonging to someone is sort of at the root of the problem. Hence the term unceded, meaning not willingly given over, handed over, or yielded up. The issue or question of property or land, the place one inhabits rather than owns, is behind, in some ways, behind all of Azuma's film and television work. Uh, and it's an idea at the heart of a film like Atan Arjuad, I think. Last month, on September 17th, to be exact, the new 2K digital restored version of Atan Arjuat was, was screened at the Inter Toronto International Film Festival to commemorate the fact that 20 years ago this fall, Atan Arjuat, the fast runner, was first released. I quote, an exciting action thriller set in ancient Igluluk, the film unfolds as a life-threatening struggle of love, jealousy, murder, and revenge between powerful, natural, and supernatural characters. Unquote. The first ever feature fiction film in Inuktitut, written, directed, produced, and performed by an Inuit cast and crew, Atan Arjuat went on to win six Genie Awards, including Best Picture and the Camera Door for Best Feature Film at the 2001 Cannes International Film Festival, among many other awards. And in 2015, it was voted the best Canadian film of all time. Well before contemporary debates around identity politics, cultural appropriation, equity, diversity, and inclusivity, Atan Arjuat set the terms of the discussion while laying out a vision for the future of Indigenous peoples in Canada and around the world, a vision of self-determination, however, that is yet to be fulfilled. The past 20 years has seen Atan Arjuat's significance manifest in several different ways, and I really like to emphasize this. It is a story. Um, as a story, the film continues to resonate all over the world with Indigenous and non-Indigenous audiences alike although maybe not in the same way. As a cultural object, the film stands as one of the most significant achievements of Indigenous self-representation. And as a film, as a work of film art, Achan Arjuat represents a great work of art cinema. Um, now I'll just briefly uh, introduce our, our uh, main guests. Um, uh, and right now I want to, uh, I guess, introduce Lucy, uh, first of all. Zach Kunuk, um, everybody I think is familiar with and is sort of a, a, a living legend of Canadian filmmaking. Um, um, Zach briefly, um, I, I mean, most, most importantly, I think co-founded Aglula Kazuma Productions in 1990 with three others, Norman Cohen, Paul Apak, and Paul Lucy, uh, uh, Quila, uh, Tilak, Quila Tilak, excuse my pronunciation. Uh, Paulusi actually appears in Atan Arjuat as a main character, one of the main characters. Um, uh, so in a nutshell, really, Kunik has gone on to win many, many awards. He has on honorary doctorates from Trent University and from Wilfrid Laurier University. Um, uh, you know about the, the, all the awards that Atan Arjuat has won. Zach has also uh, been given the National Aboriginal Achievement Award, among many others. He was named an Officer of the Order of Canada in 2015 and became a member of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences in 2017. Now, Lucy, uh, and excuse me, Lucy Tulugaryuk, Lucy Tulugaryuk, I hope I'm getting that right, um, is an actor who, in fact, plays Puya in Etan Arjuat, one of the most important uh, roles in the film. Lucy is a creative performer and also the executive director of Nunavut Independent Television, the Independent Television Network. 
Nunavut Independent Television Network, NITV. She's well known for her award-winning performances in feature films, uh, including Atanarjuad, of course, which um, went on to win all those awards. And in 2001, she was awarded the Best Actress uh, Award from the American Indian Film Institute in San Francisco. She's the co-writer and director of the 2018 feature film Tia and Piu Piuk, Puyuk, which premiered at the Carousel Children's Film Festival and the Boston's Kid Film Festival in 2018. In addition to her work in film and television, Lucy is a skilled Inuktitut translator, and she is here today with us. Um, now, because the recent because of that recent TIFF screening, and because that Tanarjuad is over three hours long, we were unable to schedule the screening to accompany this event. Um, I hope, though, that everyone has seen the film already at least once. In the event that you haven't seen it recently, I want to just begin with one clip, uh, one brief clip. Um, it's a pivotal scene just past the halfway mark. Okay, so if you remember the story, Oki, the story's villain, wants to kill Atanarjuat, his rival for the same woman, Atwat. Uh, and he also wants to kill his older brother, Am 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 uh, Amakjuat. The two men, the two brothers, are sleeping in their tent after a hard day of hunting as Oki and his two sidekicks sneak up on them. And this is also the scene where you see why Atanarjuat uh, is called the fast runner, okay? So hopefully you will all be able to see and hear this uh, properly. to uh, actually stop sharing, at least for a moment. There we go, now we can see everyone. Um, and uh, I, I apologize for the absence of subtitles. Uh, the, the character who suddenly appears um, and, and, and that Oki sees shouts, he calls him, I, it's translated as shithead or something like that. He shouts at him and then he says, uh, watch out, um, Atanarjuat's little brother is, or Amakjuat's little brother is, is running after you. Uh, and then Atanarjuat pops out of the tent. Um, so now, um, having sort of set the scene, I want to hand things over to um, our moderator for this panel, for this roundtable, which is uh, Eric Fox Tree. 
Um, I'll just briefly introduce Eric. Eric is Associate Professor of Religion and Culture at here at Wilfrid Laurier University's Waterloo campus, where he does research and teaching in the field of Native studies, dealing with Native history, colonialist mythologies, land conflicts, language ideologies, and Native visual culture, especially through sign languages and ancient iconography, but also occasionally through film. Now, so Eric, I'm going to hand it over to you to sort of um, uh, run this round table if you can. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Russell. Um, I am incredibly excited to uh, 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 be participating in this uh, event. And I, uh, as Russell did, thank all of the uh, panelists and all of the people in attendance to see this, and especially uh, our guest uh, uh, speakers. Um, and hopefully uh, uh, Zachary Skinnick will show up. Uh, but even if that's uh, not the, the, the case, uh, I expect that Lucy will be able to fill us in just incredibly about this uh, uh, film. Um, I come to this not with a great uh, a history of research into uh, uh, the Arctic. I am a language nerd and a film nerd nonetheless. And as a result, I've always loved this uh, film. And every time I watch it, I get uh, a, a new uh, angle for, for seeing it. Uh, the most, having seen this in, in the last few weeks, my most recent uh, angle for looking at it is the angle of, uh, uh, conflict between indigenous groups and peacemaking making between indigenous groups. And this is of particular interest to me because although I am not Maya myself, I have worked in the Maya area for, uh, of Guatemala and Mexico for the last 25 years. My wife is Maya and I am uh, uh, accepted pretty much as a member of the, of the uh, two communities where I uh, work most uh, deeply, and one of those has been a, under attack from an indigenous neighboring group for two years. And for the last year uh, or so, I have been uh, on a uh, advising a peace uh, uh, negotiating team from from my wife's uh, community. And um, this film, you know, has has a renewed interest to me because of that uh, 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 situation that I find myself in. And so when we get to, to, the, to that point, I will certainly be adding uh, questions, but for the moment, uh, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our uh, discussants. There are three of them uh, and I'm going to uh, allow them to give their uh, presentations, and hopefully we can we can organize this so that um, uh, people hold their questions and ask their questions via the chat uh, uh, in in messages sent to me, and I'll be reading those messages to then direct them to the. Uh, uh, discussants. What's crucial here is I, I want I want the uh, uh, the question and answer session to to hopefully come at the at the end unless there's something really really critical to uh, uh, the the meaning of a of a particular thing said by one of the um, uh, discussants. Uh, but hopefully we can get the uh, this will work better if we have the the questions take place at the end. So uh, uh, enough of the structure. Let me uh, introduce our, uh, our panelists. I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Pauline Clegg, who is an associate professor and manager of cultural, of cultural resilience hub, Jumbuna Institute for Indigenous Education and Research at the University of Technology of Sydney, Australia and an advisor for the creative arts, for creative plus business. A Yegi woman 
from north coast, uh, north south Wales. She has worked for 25 years as a storyteller and producer of film and TV. She is the founder and artistic director of Winda Film Festival in Sydney and the co-director of Native Slam, a 72 hour indigenous film challenge held in Maori land film festival in Otaki, New Zealand. Our second discussant will be uh, Simone Bignal. She is a political philosopher based in Jumbuna Institute's research hub for indigenous nations and collaborative futures at the University of Technology, of Technology in Sydney. The Jumbuna team supports indigenous nations who are rebuilding their political authority and institutions of self-governance. And Simone's philosophical work is devoted to finding potential points of alliance and shared understanding at the interface of diverse human cultures. And finally, Jenny Kerber is an associate professor of English here at Wilfrid Laurier University in Waterloo, where she teaches and researches in the fields of Canadian literature, environmental humanities, border studies, and indigenous literatures. She's currently, sorry, she's originally from, from Treaty Six territory in Saskatchewan, and she's the author of Writing in Dust, Reading the Prairie Environmentally. So with that, let me uh, turn it to, turn things to the first of our uh, discussants, Pauline Clegg. Lucy, I just, uh, first of all, wanted to acknowledge that I stand on the lands of the Wongal people here in Australia, as well as, like in uh, Canada, our country is still uh, on ceded territories. Um, I just wanted to first of all say hey to Lucy. Um, I think um, one of the things that I remember, I actually found my diary um, from Imaginative. I've um, also used to be a programmer at Imaginative uh, in Toronto. And um, I was looking through all my files on the weekend and found my diary from 2001 when Arjuna first played at um, Imaginative. Um, and I remember one of the things that really made me imagine the world was, um, it almost was like the white ice was the red sands of our country. I felt like I was watching a cousin's film. Um, the story was embedded in this, narrative that um a, you know wasn't an observation looking into our culture but an observation of someone that owns their culture and um it excited and engaged me to be really um to look around the world and see what else was happening i mean you do you do have to remember that that was a really exciting time for indigenous cinema uh around the world um you know we had you know, Zachariah coming out of uh, Inuit country, and then we had Niels Gaup coming out of Sami country. Um, Tracy Moffat was here in Australia and a couple of other big players, Merita Mita from New Zealand. Uh, Alanise of Obswan was also in Canada and um, Chris Eyre was doing smoke signals around that time as well. And so there was this sort of kind of, as one of the, new wave filmmakers that was coming up into the world during that time. It was exciting to see that we could reach to the international market and we could tell our stories without being beholden to fitting into a structure that was a lens that was different to ours. Um, and I think that was, for me, that was a culmination of realising that it was all right to tell the story with our lens. The fact that at times, um, I know Zach and um, Lucy, you know, Lucy herself is an amazing filmmaker, um, but the fact that they all supported each other and had a sumo, you know, build up and created a space for their voice to be a strength was something that was happening around the world at that time. And so utilising the like-minded 
I, I, I say it here in Australia when I lecture, you know, the reality of understanding that the niche of my world is a minority in my country. But if I include the rest of the world in terms of Indigenous, all of a sudden I've got a playing field that's 2 billion people. And I can play with that. And I think that's something that Zach has been able to do. He's been able to play in the Indigenous arena uh, with the lens that is a strength for all of us to recognise that we sometimes don't have to subtitle. I, I love the fact that it wasn't subtitled, that we still understood the story with or without the subtitles because we understand it intrinsically comes from that land and um, you know, I'm still to this day, it's one of my, you know, to-do list, bucket list things is to get up that way because that film inspired me to want to see that world in the same way that I would love for Zach to come to our side of the world and see our world. I know every time I've invited him to come to Australia, it's whale season or seal season. And so <laughs> um, it's that thing of being able to really see the effect of that a film can change the conversation. And that's what I think Arjunat really started to change the conversation about what was cinema. I remember when we you know, first started Imaginative, there was a really big discussion about do we let it just be Indigenous voices um, that be in the festival? And it was really important for everyone that um, it's our voices told in our way. Um, and I think, uh, you know, Isuma and Zach and Lucy and that team have created a platform for all of us to thrive towards as filmmakers. Sorry, that was sort of kind of like stand up and explode, but thank you, Eric, for allowing me to say that. Uh, I'm at a loss of whether I should be moving on to the next uh, uh, panelist or or uh, asking you if there's any particular uh, question you have for uh, uh, Lucy that uh, you know might uh, you know get. Uh, I think for me, um, Lucy, the one thing that um, I think has been amazing has been that it has been a platform for their community to, to look towards. Do they ever think about the international effect that they've had on our industry? Because for all of us, they have been a guide um, about how to do it. Um, also the way in which they have put I suppose the elements of the film back into the community to make sure that stories are still done by themselves. And, um, you know, the fact that she now runs the TV um, station up there, is that something that, you know, was an easy decision for her? Okay. Thank you for those questions. I appreciate them. Um, Polly, um, is it okay if I put my camera on? I'm Lucy. To look out, Koyagi Bagi, Pauline, Okadlete Saravi. Thank you for your beautiful words. I appreciate them a lot. Um, Question: uh, The first one for Tanaltrat. Um, I could say for on behalf of myself only of what I thought, and uh, I cannot speak for our community, but I could see what I have felt or observed uh, before and after the film. Mm, I can answer that part first, and then I can answer the second question in regarding Ruru TV, and if it was hard decision to to make that decision. Um, 
First of all, thank you for having me. Lucy to the voucher, you may ignore me, taxi, or do not man the Montreal me to not. She would look back down me at an outro me. Being up to a door of simmer, you may taste too many. They will cut the door of simmer, my coyer river, axum maria. No knock to a put a coyum narrow cooking on air wood. Ah, she would look back me low. Being up to long hour of simmer, man, narrow of simmer, you may. Kano tige ang ikli tige ni ang mga at nunak chua mudlo. Kano atu te karne ang mga inu katitino at chige ng itoro yarong no. Tiku yarong ka. Kuya kipagi ili sa kikang ni. I would love to say that um how what I see or what I what I've seen before the film as it was happening and after the film, once it was released and up to today, it has uh, surprised me so much how far it has reached. Um, I have never imagined that it would make it to the international level. Um, I know that I did my best in my role and it had, it inspired me a lot to relearn my own language um, that were more traditional, um, that were either um, often not used anymore and or first time I've heard it. So I would have to ask what it means, whether it was a prop such as a hunting tool, because I'm more into sewing. So if a man says, pass me this, I would be, which one? So it was a learning process too. And I learned how to throat sing from, thanks to the Tanakh Jod feature film. It was banned since early 1921 in our region, in Nunavut, Amitok area. And so I learned for the first time my mother knew how to throw things. Um, only when we were researching through the radio, um, then my mom says she can teach me. So how, how much colonial religion has impacted our own culture and beliefs and our living, breathing was taken, was such a wake up call for me during that process of script reading, uh, acting it out and finding out, relearning the Inuktitu terminology that were starting to be forgotten, such as I had to ask, um, I was having a hard time pronouncing a particular sentence. And my cousin, who's about 10 years older than me, she explains to me what I'm saying in my modern day language at the time. And she, I got it and oh, she then broke it up into this part is that so uh, so even now I have to think about what I said back then. So something like that. I haven't watched a Tanajot for a while, but um, I've learned that he's the only one who runs like that. So after I took the revenge and I tell people I have not uh, seen him for a very long time, in fact, he's dead, and he comes back. And I'm the only one in the beginning realizing he's coming back to the camp and I'm supposed to feel I'm scared 
And I'm like, oh, he's coming back. In my ancestors, my Ananas, my birth, my mom. So in one generation, it changed so rapidly because we were put into nine to 12, one to five English school. And so when we get home, that's the only really time we hear Inuktitut and then we go to bed. So more of our day was English and Inuktitut was shorter hours. And so it um, in some parts of our Canada, Inuit communities, it, uh, it impacted more than the others. Uh, we were lucky that in Igloolik, Inuit protested to have um, no TV installed in 1979, unless if there was Inuktitut broadcasting. And so there was a petition and they refused the TV the second time. And it was the latest community that um, had installed accepted television to be installed to, to the community. And so Inuktitut uh, was tested. They were given two weeks test to see if they can live stream three communities and they proved the government they can. And so Zach was one of those people in the background who created that uh, live um, behind the scene. I was already in Hall Beach where TV had already happened before Iglulik. So we would hear television news from another community before we even ever saw TV. So when I moved to Hall Beach, that was the first time I've seen TV. Again, it was all in French and English. So I wish that one day there would be an Uptitut program. And eventually there was a midnight buzz one day, one night. And I told my mom to wake me up to see the live stream from Iglulik Iqaluit. And I believe it was in Pondinlet. And they spoke in Inuktitut. It was all done in by Inuit for Inuit. I've even asked to be woken up. And that was the first, um, wow, it can be done. I was only six years old, maybe. And so it was my um, spark of, I wish there was Inuktitut. I wish there was more Inuktitut. If that one show can go, I wish there was more Inuktitut and then Inuit Broadcasting Corporation was introduced. And then Isuma was the first independent um, filmmaker, uh, feature film, making feature films. And so, and when we made Atanarjot, that was the first ever feature. So I don't think the community expected a lot to, to have gone this far, 20 years of, um, winnings and uh, acknowledgements and appreciations, both from our own Inuit and from indigenous people all over the world and non-indigenous people. It really has been a big teaching film and open door, as you said, Pauline, um, and led believing that uh, we can make films, we can tell our own stories in our own voice, in our own props, our own costumes, and uh, anything is possible. I never ever thought it would be up at the biggest top Keynes Film Festival. So when I walked in one night, one day and um, my partner says, hey, you're on, Zach is on TV, Norman's on TV. I felt like I was dreaming because I, they were live on Kane's Film Festival and it was unreal, but real. And then going to Toronto Film Festival with all the 10 of us uh, cast and crew was beautiful. Um, inspiration, open my, um, my window to where I am today, really. 
um, inspiration from our elders, believing from our elders that have taught to us our language, our culture. Um, my mom, Ananaganatikutuk, uh, she was my guardian, my um, teacher, my love, my angel on earth, and so was my Atata, my father. They were both my teachers, traditionally, traditional songs, legends, myths. Um, so th my parents were my first teachings when I was growing up. But when it really came to the film, Isuma was the first to be part of in the film, acting for the first time. Um, and uh, I never knew that it would lead to directing my own film, uh, children's film. So anything is possible if you work hard to it for it. It doesn't come easy. You have to work hard. Some people often judge us and stereotype Inuit as um, lazy and drunks or uh, uneducated, but that's an old fashioned way of thinking. Um, the government has to put their responsibility and educate the rest of the world that we are updated, we are educated, we are not drunks. We are, a lot of us are sober. A lot of us are working hard, earning our income, bringing food to our table, paying bills, having internet. And no, we don't live in igloos because I'm still asked today if we still live in igloos. And that's how far the rest of the world has to update. Um, I live in Montreal now. Um, so I've been here for three years. So far, I've been asked three times, different random people, oh, you're from the north. Do you live in Igloos? <laughs> so it's still teaching, um, it's still teaching the world, but uh, it has also opened up a lot of people's eyes, um, as you said, that um, we are not history. We are here, we live, we speak, we breathe inuktitut, and we are strong and confident to be who we are because it was trying to be put down on us by Christianity, by government, by agencies, by residential school, by police department, um, sometimes, uh, People assume that was history. It exists today. We see injustice. We see um, stereotype a lot. But uh, after the unearth of babies and children in Kamloops, many people have turned their heads and realized that we were not telling lies after all. We've been telling the truth all these years, since our kids were kidnapped, since our parents' kids were kidnapped, my, my, I have siblings who've gone through residential school. I saw my parents, uh, the effect of them um, being kidnapped and taken and come back for two months at a time for let's say from age three, four to 18, some return, some don't, some by choice, some by no choice. And this is real. And some say that get over it. Those who are so ignorant, and I'm not sorry to say that, those who are too ignorant to face the fact that they exist and there are no higher power than anyone, than indigenous people, who are all human beings. There is no inferior, there is no in superior. Why do we treat the dogs better sometimes 
even if they're small, big, husky house pets, we love them as humans. And then we see our own flesh and blood. We judge. Why? Colonial, colonization. Um, Miss teaching, teaching the society what was not right. Our, my own grandfather, my father, I grew up with. He had taken me to a site where he said, I was 11 years old that my father, my little sister who was six at the time, if I'm 11, and we, my father took us to this site. Knut Rasmussen, in his uh, fifth expedition, he notes two young men brings us from Igloolik to Repulse Bay, now yet. So Atata, my father, I, I'm 11, and he tells me, my uncle George, I called him Ananatyak, which means grandmother. I am named after um, Uyak. He's Kapianak. Kapianak was my grandmother in my namesake. In Inuit tradition, our namesake is very strong and we respect it and we use it. And again, through colonial, that is shifting. We're now into English names, but I'm trying to stick to Inuktitut names in my own family. Well, my youngest one. Anyway, so this thing is real, and but we are waking up. And I used to be taught in grade three that Native people are, uh, I don't want to say it, but I would um, question it. And when I moved out of high school and went to so post-secondary school, we went to Yellowknife, the capital of Northwest Territories, before we became Nunavut, I was scared to walk on the street myself because I was scared of Dene. I was taught that they were too mean. But in my own eyes, one month later, I'm learning we're more related than we have ever been compared to settlers. So uh, in my own childhood to teen years, I was shifting and relearning that. And as through film, I was relearning my language, my culture, and to get to Kunuti story, my second feature film with Zacharias was uh, the journals of Knut Rasmussen, the author of the exiles, and in his uh, uh, the author of the um, yeah uh, explore the expedition expedition, and um, so my atata was the young man with my uncle George Ananatya, bringing Knut Rasmussen, uh, the famous uh, Greenlandic Danish anthropologist. And so these connections are real. Look, I'm real. We're real. And I love that we're all here, different ethnic group, and we are able to connect. And we're taking time to understand each other. And we're making change. And so even though what I said, it cannot be denied, we cannot deny what's happening today. It is real. And I love the fact that we're trying to have the um, unite the world, uh, I hope, to become more unity. Yeah. We all have our own language. We all have our own culture. We have our own beliefs. Um, yeah. Thank you for your question. and. Long answer. <laughs> well, uh, 
thank you, uh, uh, Lucy, for that exciting and inspiring answer. Uh, uh, let me just note that you had begun uh, saying that you weren't going to be able to give an answer to uh, Pauline's actual question, which was uh, about changes in the community that you're gonna be able to talk about uh, uh, changes you felt. But in fact, uh, you got around to discussing tremendously changes in, in the community. And the second part of her question of, of uh, uh, Pauline's question had to do with the impact of film in particular and, and, and the changes caused by film in the community. And you got to that as well. So I don't think anybody is disappointed by, uh, by this long uh, answer. It was great. Let me just turn back to Pauline quickly to see if there was any quick follow-up that you want to get to. And then if not, we'll move on to the next uh, I, panelist. I just, I just wanted to say hello to Zach, who's finally, hi Zach, who's finally come on board as well. Um, uh, I think one of the things I, uh, I was very nervous. I remember the first time I interviewed Zach. Um, <laughs> I was so nervous and, and it was like, he was our film god um, for so many of us that have walked behind him um, in terms of cinema. Um, and one of the things um, I would like to say to Zach is I've learned, I, I actually think he's one of the people that has made me redefine decolonization and using the word indigenization. Because if we indigenify, you know, he, he actually didn't, there's no decolonization going on. It's just the indigenous story being told. Um, and so that truth of that space has been something that's been really rich in terms of the body of work that um, Zach has done, but how Arjunat allowed us to just breathe in that space. Um, and to watch the film with or without subtitles, as I said before, you were able to still capture the story of the, of, of the land and of those people. Okay. Uh, welcome, Zacharias. Uh, uh, do you have any uh, uh, quick response to uh, Pauline's uh, remarks? I didn't hear her question, but I was late trying to log in. I'm in oh. Italy. Uh, um, I'm 200 miles of the Arctic Circle. So I have little problems here and there. Uh, but okay. could I hear her question? Her original question was, um, uh, what changes to the community uh, you think might have been uh, might have resulted from the film and the making of the film? And second, what uh, changes have happened with, particularly with respect to, to filmmaking in the, in the community that you can attribute to uh, the uh, uh, Fast Runner? Uh, for asking. Um, you know, we live up here in the far north, and, and for us to work up here uh, in the North Arctic Canada, where, where Canada is from St. John's to Vancouver, but we're up here in the Arctic, so we're out of the loop sometimes. Um, and this, um, when I I was born on the land in 1957. When I was five years old, I walked out of our sod house and I walked through our ice porch and I go outside and I thought we were the only people on earth. Definitely I was wrong. <laughs> but when I was nine years old, I was sent to Igloolik uh, to learn English and in the community hall, they used to show movies. And we tried to sneak in and we tried to carve soap stone and sell it so we could go to movies. And 
that's how it was. And when I watch movies, I thought they were God sent. Uh, it just happens in a good story with a good ending. Um, we never knew how many people worked behind the camera. We didn't even know there was a camera. Uh, but when I went to school, in my social studies, I learned about Africa. I learned about giraffes. I learned about elephants, monkeys, and tigers, and whatever animal they have there. Animals that I will never hunt in my life. So when I was growing up, I was so interested in my own culture because my culture is, it has everything. Stars have names, the land has names in Inuktitut. Stars have names in Inuktitut. Um, and we all have names in, uh, and beliefs and stories. Uh, like Lucy said, when Christianity came a hundred years ago, here in Igloolik, we've been here 4,000 years. Uh, Christianity came a hundred years ago, and you can't compare a hundred years to 4,000. It doesn't balance at all. Uh, but um, for us, when we learn these movies are made with camera and actors, we went to work um, in 1997. Uh, we started, I mean, we were doing short documentaries uh, before, uh, but we want to move into a bigger ambitious project like a future film. Uh, we didn't, I mean, we were just learning. In 97, uh, we applied uh, for funding. Uh, we kept asking in the kid, in the Canadian film system um, in, the 90, in the 1997, the film financing system was not, not made for us. Uh, it was made for the English and the French. Um, so whatever other was, that's where we were. Uh, other meant immigrants and Aboriginal people of Canada. And when we looked into our envelope, uh, there was a $200,000 in there to make a movie. And then another hidden 200,000 uh, as the system is like that. It was 400,000, you can't even make a movie. Uh, so we made a lot of noise and I think they wanted to shut us down. So they gave us some year end money and we went to work. I remember when we started at Nadjot uh, with late Paul Apek, uh, who was the director of at Nadjot, and I was in second in command. Um, we ran into a brick wall for in the film financing world. We had all the elements of a future film. We had murder, we had sex, we had jealousy, uh, rape, I mean, we, we, we had it, we had a good story. So, uh, and they started to ask me how, I mean, if you want to tap onto the English envelope, uh, could you dub your Inuit to English? I mean, uh, your actors are Inuit, but could they start speaking English? And, I was so afraid because I have seen Kung Fu movies. The real bad Kung Fu movies are really, when they're dubbed to English, it's really bad. <laughs> and I knew that uh, we were going to come out like that. No, we can't do that. So what if we do subtitles? I mean, that was the only option. Uh, that we saw, otherwise we we're gonna look like a bad Kung Fu movie. Um, so when we, we put this community to work, I've never seen so much cooperation in a community. Elders working with young people, um, elders that are born on the land like me, uh, who sticks caribou skin just by 
measuring you by with their hands and string, uh, they would fit it our cost uh, actors like that. And it, their costume fit perfect. And I didn't want to mingle because up here in the Arctic, there's so many, it's so big. And everywhere we go, we go central, it's a different dialect. If we go to the West, it's a different dialect. So I, I didn't want it to mix dialects. Um, so I we just used Igloric area dialect and Igloric costume design. Um, and we went to work. Boy, we didn't even know the conventional shooting days of a future film. Uh, now we know it's 21 days, but when we went shooting, we shot and shot and shot. It took us a whole year with a few months off here and there because uh, this story happens in the four seasons. Um, so we were working hard, working hard. We finally, finally finished the film, and and this is our. You know what we were gearing up uh, because in '97 we when we went after financing, we sort of got kicked around. In '98 we're running out of time because in 1999, Nunavut territory was going to be carved out of Canada. And the idea was we're gonna come with a movie. So we were rushing, we were rushing, and we're late. And then that would happen and our film opened in 2001. So we were two years late, uh, but we made it. And, and I thought when we presented this movie at an Antwerp, in our community, because our community, we wanted to show it to our community first, because these elders who drove dog team across the tundra knew every little mistake that we will make. So it was like we wish, I was shaking like a leaf because uh, when we started showing the film in the, the biggest building in, Igloric is a gymnasium, the school gymnasium. And people would laugh watching a movie, this movie, our movie. So we were on the right track. Um, and then we took it to Cannes. Um, and we were in first sitting regard category. Uh, of course, I'm, I'm there. Uh, and it's my first time, I'm not expecting to win. I mean, I've seen more experienced filmmakers there than me, uh, but but we won, and we won. I, I was so shocked and I was hoping that um, we would learn from our mistakes. And there we were, uh, we came back to Canada and we didn't know nobody ever won this uh, golden camera award in Canada and we took it home and I didn't know. And so we were going through a lot of changes uh, for better. Wait a minute. Thank you, Zacharias. Um, I think I'm gonna uh, move us on to the the, the next discussant. Uh, that would be uh, Simone Bignal. Uh, what would you like to add to our discussion here? Uh, thank you, thank you so much. Um, look, let me begin by saying how honored I am to be here. I'm grateful, of course, to Professor Kilborn and um, and to you, Eric, and to um, your co-organizers for planning this very interesting event and for inviting me to attend today. So uh, Wilfrid Laurier University stands on the traditional territories of the Anishabi, Haudenosaunee and neutral peoples. And as a virtual visitor to this place today, 
I'd like to thank these nations for their hospitality and to recognize their continuing sovereignty and cultural authority. And I'm joining you uh, from the traditional lands of the Ghana people in what is now known as Adelaide in Australia. And I'd like also to acknowledge and respect the unceded sovereignty of the Ghana nation on whose lands I live and work. Finally, of course, I would especially like to thank Zach and Lucy for the opportunity to discuss uh, their wonderful film, um, Atanajo at the Fast Runner. And before I offer my thoughts on their film, I would like to acknowledge the cultural authority of the Asuma Collective and the Igloo Lit community and the Inuit people of Nunavut more generally um, as keepers of the traditional Atanajo at story. So, I know that for uh, the Indigenous peoples of the Arctic North, colonialism comes from the direction of the South. I'm here today as a, as a non-Aboriginal political philosopher from a place so far South that it, it, you know, it's, it's Australia. As you might know, Australia remains one of the most severely colonised parts of the world. Our settler colonial governments have never entered into any kind of treaty agreements um, securing the sovereign self-governance rights of First Nations. And this situation, its, um, it's continuing legacy of profound injustice has shaped me as a thinker, as a non-Aboriginal thinker um, and as an activist. And it informs the perspectives that I want to bring to this discussion today. So as I said, I'm a, I'm a philosopher. I know very little about um, cinema studies or you know, technical aspects of filmmaking or cinematography. So my contribution, the contribution I'd like to offer today is focused really on the conceptual content of the film. You know, it's, it's political promise, it's critical capacity, and what I see as its socially transformative potential as well. So, you know, what then makes Atanajo such a, you know, such an extraordinary film, such a great film, such an important film, um, you know, in my view? Well, aside from its cinematic appeal, its visual beauty, the really gripping storyline that, you know, that we know so well, for me, there are three really key philosophical political elements that I think are overlaid and woven together to make Atanajuat a rich and evocative conceptual experience. And I'd like to say something, you know, very briefly in the time we have about each of these in turn. So firstly, and this has been touched on by, um, by Pauline, Zach and Lucy a bit so far, Atanajuat is very obviously an exemplary cinematic work of Inuit storytelling and self-representation addressed in the first instance to Indigenous community viewers. Perhaps this was especially pertinent, um, as Zach suggests, at the time when the film was made in the context of the creation of the self-governing Nunavut territory in, in 1999. Um, so Atanajo the Fast Runner can be seen above all else, I think, as a strategic exercise of the kind of cultural revival and resilience work that is a primary element of Indigenous nation rebuilding and political resurgence. And, um, you know, it's happening all around settler colonial nations, um, as we know. Um, Pauline has already touched upon this point as well. For my part, though, I want to draw our attention to another of the film's more subtle nation rebuilding elements. So Aboriginal nation resurgence is very strongly about giving hope to disaffected youth, um, combating really dire rates of Indigenous youth suicide, and enabling pride through identification. I know um, that in some of your early interviews, Zach, uh, you explained the importance of this motivation to you, you know, giving, giving youth something to hold on to. So I see this film as really remarkable for the way it offers hope and conceptual resources for Inuit people, both young and old, um, as they or as you address the colonial present with all its distresses. And although the film is set in the pre-colonial past and you know, Western or, or Southern presence is nowhere indicated in this film, I was really struck by how the film even so seems to offer an allegory of, of colonialism. You know, conflict is, is brought to the community by a stranger visiting from outside um, who introduces a kind of split to the group so that one group begins killing, scheming, manipulating relations, cheating, lying, raping, and being pretty generally abusive and disrespectful. So if this doesn't mirror the behavior of settler colonial governments and their institutions, then I, I don't know what does. Also in the film, the second group of people comprising um, you know, the extended family of Tulimuk and Pitaluk and their sons, 
um, Amar, Amar Jawak and uh, Atanawa Jawat, this group really bears the brunt of this beha bad behavior of the first group, but they carry on with life as best they can. And eventually they manage to restore a kind of peace and balance. So the message here, I think, to the younger generations is, you know, we Inuit have the cultural resources and the ancestral knowledge to deal with intergenerational social trouble like colonialism like brings us. Wrongdoers will get their comeuppance. Those who are mistreated and hurt can with time become a force of reckoning. Just keep being strong and strategic, tread the right path as our traditions and elders instruct and don't give up hope. So um, the second thing about the film then for me is that it's not only a particular tale grounded in Inuit traditions, which speaks directly and explicitly to the specific people of, of Igloolik and, and of Nunavut. It also tells a story, I think about the human condition more generally. The film contributes in my view to international understandings and appreciations of potentially universal values of right and wrong. And it offers models of reprisal or retribution, reconciliation and forgiveness that may well find application applications in other situations of human conflict. And I, I thought it was very interesting at the start when Eric was talking about the significance of the film for him as a kind of model for, for peace building um, in the context of conflict. So to quote uh, Mr. Zacharias Kunuk himself, the film amply demonstrates that igloo-lit artists at the millennium have something to contribute to national and international discourses in media, art, culture, and communication. Some reviewers and scholars have indeed celebrated Atanajo at the Fast Runner as a kind of Homerian or Shakespearean style epic of universal significance. And they might also have, but to my knowledge, haven't, compared it with epic tales from outside of the Western tradition, you know, such as the ancient Indian epic of the Mahabharata, which um, sort of deals with conflict uh, within a family or between families. That they didn't um, sort of reference these non-Western um, connections, I think says something really meaningful about how settler colonials think about universality in ways that are actually pretty parochial and Eurocentric. Writing in um, 1952, in his landmark text, Discourse on Colonialism, the Haitian poet of negritude, Ami Césaire, scoffed at Western universalism, saying, at the moment it most often mouths the word, the West has never been further from being able to live a true humanism, a humanism made to the measure of the world. And I think the false universalism on the part of the West remains evident in some of the commentary about the film that accuses indigenous cultural activities of lacking authenticity when they connect with national and international audiences and aspirations and seek to integrate in traditional perspectives with contemporary sensibilities. Sometimes, of course, using new media technologies and with funding received from, um, from settler colonial states. So I find this both amusing and also concerning, disturbing even. It is as if such critics truly believe that indigenous cultures can only ever be authentic and deserving of consideration when they are fully traditional and particular, bound as they often are to define territories and, and a set of, um, of ancient customs that carry forward into, into the present and the future. And conversely then only non-indigenous cultures, in fact, only Western cultures, it seems, should be considered properly universal in their expressions of what it means to be human. Of course, you know, in reality, all human cultures adapt over time. And so all are at once contemporary and at the same time, they contain the legacies of their pasts. And all are at once particular to a place and at the same time, contributors to global humanity. If Homer's epic was universal in its themes, it was also undeniably Greek. Likewise, if Atanaja, which is a story that is particular to Inuit and insular in its focus in that way, its themes are nevertheless common, I think, to diverse human societies across the globe. So this brings me then to my, my third point of reflection about the film. Um, for me, Atanajuit is not only an exemplary work of indigenous nation building through the medium of artistic production. It's not only an articulation of the human condition 
from the cultural perspective of, of humans living in Igloolik. But it's also a really wonderful example of what we call, um, what we're starting to call post-human cinema. So post-humanism is critical of the Western tradition of humanism that was the hallmark of enlightenment thinking and it kind of underpins that colonial rationality. So this claims universal qualities for humankind, especially instrumental and objective rationality and superiority of, of the human over all forms of planetary life. But actually, Western humanism is narrowly about the Western values of the white man rather than universally relevant for all peoples everywhere. The film Atanajwa presents the human experience of being Inuit as an alternative narrative to Western imperial humanism. And in so doing, I think it contributes to an expanded notion of human achievement that is more genuinely universal in its scope, more made to the measure of the world. In all its real diversity, of course. And as the film shows so strikingly, part of this alternative expression of what it means to be human is a vision of human life as intimately interconnected with the natural world of, of ice and wind and animals and deeply dependent on it rather than ideally separate from it and dominating over it. This emphasis on relationality is, I understand, common to indigenous ways of being and knowing. Um, it's common to many Eastern philosophies of being. And it's also common to Western post-humanism as a critical strain recently enjoying new prominence within the tradition of Western thought. So those are the three things that I, um, I draw from the film and why I find it so inspirational and conceptually compelling to me. I'll leave it there now so we can open up to questions. Thank you, uh, Simone. Um, let me uh, then turn it over to uh, Lucy and Zacharias to see uh, uh, if you have anything uh, to say in response to uh, Simone's statement. Yes, um, I don't know do it is an international story, but when we heard it, uh, it was in our sad house when we used to sleep side by side and mother telling the story over there and we would fall asleep. This story at Anandjian is known from Alaska to Greenland. And so uh, each area tells it a little bit differently, but and, uh, in what, and we also changed the ending and we also changed the end of the story. Um, when we were filming this at, at the Nandua, there was so much going on in this world. Um, we had the Gulf War, we had desert storm, um, things that we thought we would never see in our home. We're watching airplanes flying by, missiles flying by, and and it happened in that era and we changed the ending because in the true story of Atanandjot, Atanandjot kills uh, the bad guys in the ice igloo where he has, he just clubs them dead. And, and in our show, he just clubs to the side of his head. And said the killing stops here. So we were, we were um, watching the world killing itself. And we wanted our movie to say it ends here. So the killing stops here. And um, I thought that's the main change we did in that analogy. Billy Lucy. I, I think it was like you said earlier, or was it uh, Pauline? Even with no subtitles, everyone understood it. It's a human feeling, human um, that is recognized of all emotions everywhere, all over the world. 
So um, I think it's about time we have to start um, understanding that uh, Aboriginal people are no different really than non-Aboriginal people. We're all humans. Inuk means human. Inuit means people. So that's a beauty of our culture and our language. That's what I could say. Thank you, Lucy and, and Zacharias. Um, I want to uh, get back to uh, uh, a point that Simone uh, raised about uh, the film being uh, an anti-colonial story. Do either of you have some uh, uh, input about uh, whether that was a conscious uh, effort perhaps, or whether you now reflect that that's part of the story uh, that's being told? I remember when we first came up with that and after it, everybody thought it was a documentary. Um, because they've seen documentaries of our culture. They thought it was a documentary. Uh, but how could you have documentary when you have sex and cheating wives and how, how could that be doc documentary? <laughs> That's all I can say. You really lose it. Lucy? Sorry, what was the question again? Um, uh, I, I wanted to know if either of you had uh, uh, something to say about uh, Simone's comment that she sees the film as, as engaged in an anti-colonial uh, discourse that, or, or a, a uh, uh, that it's a description of colonialism. I think it's both. Um, I say that because um, uh, Inuit is, uh, even though I keep saying we are human, we have to combine and understand that we're all humans, but we all also have our own identity and regions and treaties and, um, you know, uh, dialects. So, I answer both ways that I love the fact that we showed the world who we are as Inuit, as um, first people of Canada. And I also love the fact that when we walked out of Toronto International Film Festival, the first premiere we've ever did and to see line up that lasted a long line of all different faces. And one right across from me, she had tears and clapping. And I could see with no words that it meant a lot to her. And that time, moment, I realized how powerful it really was to present this film and to see it beyond and to present it in different film festivals, international level or national level, um, even in our communities in Nunavut. Um, many people have learned from this film, Inuit and non-Inuit. So I think that it's both yes answer that we are, um, we have produced Inuit story by Inuit for Inuit and also for the international as humanity. And um, so, yes, that's my thought. It's lovely to hear you say that, Lucy. I should, uh, and, I, and the reason is because the first time I showed this film in a class, I had students write an essay uh, 
for that class where they had seen a whole bunch of Indigenous films and they were supposed to write about the relationship of any of those films to colonialism. And the best paper in the class was one that said pretty much what you just said, that this is a fantastic, uh, uh, a fantastically anti-colonial uh, uh, film because it frankly just ignores uh, the Western audience. It doesn't uh, speak uh, in English or French. It doesn't follow Western uh, storylines. It follows Inuit storylines. It, it's written uh, for Inuit. It's filmed in Inuit, uh, telling an Inuit story. And, and that that in itself was the ultimate in anti-colonial uh, efforts. Uh, and of course, folded within it, as Simone mentioned, there are these aspects that you could read as a commentary on dealing with the uh, uh, the changes introduced by the evil outsider. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm really uh, uh, excited that you gave that that answer. Um, let me uh, uh, advance forward to our uh, third and final panelist, uh, Jenny Kerber, to see uh, so we can all hear what she has to uh, uh, say about this film. Jenny, are you there? Yeah, there I'm here, are. Eric. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's an honor to be here and to, to listen to the thoughts of, of Zach and Lucy and, and Pauline and Simone and Eric, all of you. Um, I come at this film from the perspective of, I, I teach literature, uh, so I wouldn't say I'm a, a cinema expert or anything like that. Um, the first time I saw Atanarjuat was in a theater in Toronto during, not long after it came out, and it was a summer heat wave. It was about 42 degrees, I think, in Toronto in my, you know, my brick apartment with no air conditioning or anything. And I remember going down to the Carlton Cinema on College Street and sitting in the dark of this sweltering afternoon and just being utterly transported uh, in the most wonderful way to another time, to another culture, to another landscape. And um, yeah, that, that experience is, will always be etched in my mind. Um, I'm speaking to you today from my sort of pandemic quarters here. I live in Tecaranto, um, which is the territory of many nations, but including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat. Um, and of course, now it is home to many First Nations, Inuit and Métis people as well. Uh, in terms of, you know, thinking about the film and things I'd like to just ask Zach and Lucy about, um, I mean, one, I suppose, one thing that struck me watching the film again last week was the way that it explores leadership, you know, and what it means to be a good leader or maybe not a good leader. Um, I think this also speaks to the indigenization as well, like thinking about indigenous ideas about leadership and what we might learn from that. You know, I'm a settler. Um, what do you think that the way leadership is talked about in the film reveals about Inuit ways of knowing and doing things? And how might the ideas of leadership explored in the film apply or not to the Inuit context today, say as you, Zach, and, and Lucy see it. Um, a second thing that you know, struck me again so much about the film is, and Simone talked a, some about this, is just the, the prevalence of animals and, and animal life and animal kin. They're just everywhere in this film. It's terns and snowy owls and a walrus heart that is fed to those two young boys at the beginning, you know, where, where they're told they're going to they're going to help us one day. Or the rabbit foot, um, the rabbit's foot, um, and many other animals besides seal hunting. I, I was just wondering if you wanted to talk or reflect a little bit about, you know, the significance of animals in the film for you and, and maybe for 
teaching, you know, as well, youth about relationships to animals, um, that kind of thing. I just sort of leave that that open for you to think about or, or talk about as you see fit. It just struck me how important animal life is to who Inuit are, right? And um, so, yeah, that may be something to, to think about. Um, and then the other thing that I was noticing was the role of silence or not speaking amongst certain characters at really key moments in the film in certain situations. And I was wondering if, if you would like to speak a bit on the role of silence, how you tried to film that or, you know, how that was written into the script or how much the actors kind of took the lead on interpreting that. Um, but there just seems like to me at key moments, there's this importance of remaining silent sometimes. Um, yeah. And, uh, I know Panic Pack, especially, you know, she remains silent at these very key moments. So, yeah, I'll, I'll just put those questions to you and you can take them up as you wish or not. You guys don't need me. So Lucy and Zacharias just, you know, mm -hmm. pipe right in. <laughs> okay, uh, I'll take a crack at it. The word of silence. Um, in our culture, uh, we watch and learn. Um, we don't ask too much. How do you do that? How do you make that? We don't really ask those questions. We watch. I watch my father building a sled. He's tying with seal skin rope. But I know how seal skin ropes are made, so I don't have to ask that question. But the way that he does it, ties knots, and just watch. And when I'm growing up, I'm trying it on my own. Oh, I remember this, how he made it. So it's mostly watching. We watch and learn. We watch and learn because up here, there's no trees up here. There's no, and our culture never had paper, never had anything to write on. So we watch and learn all the important deals like marriages and deal, hunting buddy deals are all done in the head. So if you break up deed, <laughs> shamanism was the main tool. And when we, when we were making Adunanduet, Christianity was at its highest. And so shamanism, to talk about shamanism, was like you're against the religion, but we're not against the religion because that's what brought us here today. Um, and all the oral teaching that we get from our parents, don't hunt more than you need. Don't forget, don't hunt more than you need. But we see in this world war, fishing more than we need. Were, <laughs> but in, in our culture, uh, we we love the animals because we live with the animals. And oral teaching that I've studied tells me that I use. All the elders tell me if I see a sick animal, kill it. Uh, there's lots of seals up here. I'll shoot one. I'll shoot two, and don't shoot anymore. And these are oral teachings that are passed down to us. Um, so it's, we're very limited, but Christianity has no taboos. Shaman have taboos. But when Christianity came, everything was broken so we could break taboos. Um, and we started to live in limbo. Uh, but but um, it's interesting. It's the silence. Is you watch and learn, and and we try to make these films authentic, the right as possible. Because thinking that a hundred years from now, when we're long, long gone and dead, uh, people will study these films. 
And how do you make a dog harness? Well, you watch our film. Uh, that's uh, the silence we put in the movie. It will be Lucy. Even today, people are studying our films. Um, I would like to mention that in Sachs said, in 100 years, people will watch our films and study it. Yes, that's true. But people are so watching our films, studying from it, and universities are using our film to teach about Inuit and Indigenous people and language. And, you know, it's been used in universities, um, college, high school, uh, internet. So, even my daughter, who's in university now, first generation um, to be in university, she was a baby when we were making this film. So she was going to be the first uh, baby Puya in the first feature film. And now she was uh, calling me one day quite, um, she's, uh, she says, my instructor is trying to teach me about the Inuit and I'm Inuk and he says, I, I have to listen and learn Atanagjot, the fast runner. And I told him, I am in Atanagjot, the fast runner in the beginning. If you flip the last page, you'll see me and my mom. So um, it really has, uh, we're at the stage where sh we're shifting. Now my baby's the, uh, the first one in our generation, in my family tree anyways, to be in the uh, university level and learning and presenting. This is our people, this is from my hometown and, um, and correcting some phrases the instructor may have said because he or she may not ever have stepped up north and they say they have the degree, master's degree in indigenous studies. So really, you want to learn, check us out. We know the facts, we live it, we breathe it, we eat it. <laughs> um, and some people are really against animals. We love animals. It's in our culture to respect animals, like Zach said, take what you need and leave the rest for later so that you're not running out and leaving the rest for the generation not to have some. That's not ever in our culture. We've always been taught as little kids, you respect insects, animals, sea animals, um, because the Life cycle is unity as well. So if you disrespect the animal, the karma can come back to you. And that's the Inuit belief. And it's still a practice today. We still practice it today. We love our food. We respect our animals. And we share what we catch. We make garments. We use, we warm. We are warm. Um, and we don't do it with, use it every day nowadays when we go out on the land to go fishing or caribou hunting. We may switch to our modern clothing, store-bought clothes, or some of us still use caribou outfits and seal skin outfits or combined together. So to us, Inuit culture, animal is part of our living. So we dare not disrespect animals because we fear that it can interrupt us in the moment or in the future, my children or our children's children. So we strongly believe even today that we take what we can from the land or the sea and we respect the insects and every bird. And so that's what we do. It, it's the elders maybe that may not be respecting that because I don't know, maybe they've lost their customs. I don't know. Um, but 
we still strongly believe to uh, respect what is given to us from the land. And we say thank you when we receive it. Um, it's part of who we are. We're not vegans. We're not vegetarians. We have two summers of the whole year. Um, and it costs a lot to power the Arctic 10 months out of the year. So there's not really um, vegetation in the north. So everything is flying up, flowing up north. And once, uh, once a year we get shipped during the summer. So it's best to go back to our land, our water for food that we've always relied on. Thanks to our ancestors, we are here today. And so I'm proud to say I love country food and I respect all animals that is given to us. And I hope I have passed on that respect to my children and now my grandchild. Mm. Thank you, Lucy and, and Zacharias. Um, uh, let me take a step back to the to the first of the three uh, uh, issues that Jenny Kerber had raised and and ask uh, either of you if you could say anything about uh, the representation of of what leadership is in the film, or perhaps to phrase it differently, uh, what do you think the film tells us, the viewer, about how uh, Inuit leadership is either the same or different from uh, the way that leadership functions in the rest of Canada, or second, how, whether it is uh, the same or different from what people think of as universal notions of, of leadership. What makes a, uh, an Inuit leader special? Um, we think we, the rest of the world thinks I, that's the difference. In Inuit, we think about um, as a whole, the village, the community, whether it may be, or a camp, we dare not leave anyone behind during blizzard or you know, if ice breaks up, we help. We don't say, oh, I have a machine to look after. See you. That's selfish. So that's a difference between Inuit leadership that we think we and consider what is the best thing to do for everyone from right from wrong versus a colonial leadership where Oh, money comes in, money talks. Um, sometimes um, attacking happens, lying happens. Those were taught to us since kids not to, to do. So that's a difference between Inuit culture and non-Inuit leadership is that children are taught from childhood to respect, to, to tell the truth and to think about other people, not only about yourself. And if that is uh, the structure that saves family, the community that has survived for millennia, it is still going to survive for more millennia, I hope, because that's what how our ancestors survived. And I hope that we will continue to practice that belief that we, we must help each other for the best to survive, to live. Um, 
and not just be stingy, not be I, it's best for me, forget about the rest of what other people think, but as a whole, if it may be a, a home, a community, a city, a country. So that's how I can answer. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. I think what, one of the things for me um, is that when I um, start, that's why I started writing about Indigenous archetypes, because a hero's motivation and how people see an Indigenous lens, but a hero's motivation is often ego. The motivation is all about the cardinal of ego. And for a warrior, the motivation is community. Uh, and so how, how do we then start to look at the Indigenous lenses that are out there uh, and, and get to see how to read them better so that they're not put the lens of, you know, those people that write the reviews about our films are not put on with a lens that is the ego because you're reading it wrong in that first place. Sorry to interrupt if I was interrupting Zach. Come here. Um... I've never really heard about any leadership when I was growing up because oral teaching taught us that you have to respect people that are older than you. You can't even say their names because uh, you call, call them by nicknames. Uh, but that refers to the shaman world when in those days, when you speak somebody's name, an elder's name, what if there happened to be a shaman? They will hear you and they will see you anywhere you are. And it's bad, it's danger for you. And so we had to respect, but when Christianity came, we forgot about that. Um, Leadership was like our elders are our leaders, but in, in the Inuit hunting culture, it's a hunting culture. Best hunters are leaders uh, because, because in, in my community, we're walrus hunters. We hunt walrus. In the dead of winter at minus 45, and imagine, before guns, they would only hunt them with spears. And there's a whole art of hunting and what you're supposed to do. And the Inuit knew that. They had to know the weather, where the weather is coming from. And they had to know uh, what to do. I mean, it, it fascinates me that the walrus hunter who runs on a thin ice runs on a bouncing ice. I mean, I ran on a bouncing ice and I fell in. But, but how do you, how did I do it? I asked, how did you not fall into the uh, uh, ice, through the ice? Well, just watch what polar bears do. They spread their legs when they're on thin ice. That's what you do. So, it's, uh, best hunters would be leaders and uh, in the community. Of course, there would be um, um, people who are poor, mistreated. Uh, of course, that happens uh, because uh, when there's too many people, there's too many mouth to feed. And of course, some got left behind, but in the oral teaching, we are told to watch out for these. Watch out who is being mistreated, so you treat them fairly. So leadership in the Inuit culture, because we're always traveling around the land, like little pockets of families are on the land. So their bosses, the father is the boss. Well, that's in my time, that's how it was. 
He's the boss, he's the hunter, he provides us food and he builds our house and keeps our house warm and makes us sled so we can go sliding down on the hills. And uh, so I think it was a little, a little more, little leadership. And when there was a starvation, it happened. People starved to death out here in the olden days. But they're always fun. They're always fun because the clan and the leader in the area sends people searching for them. They know where they are. They know where they went, but they just don't know where they are. Um, so also food, when they're starving, food is transported by dog team to them. That happened in our area. So it was sharing. Um, leadership was more distant. Uh, you, you wouldn't see your leader for a long time, maybe two years, three years. So in our, in our area, uh, there was this starving woman at Utaru, who starved, her family starved to death and she survived and she became the leader in the area because and her leadership meant that every hunter bring their skins to her and she distributes them to women. So every man will have good clothes, every children will have good clothes. So that's how leadership was for us. I would also add that because things happen so rapidly in our Inuit culture within 40 to 60 years, so much changed. Like uh, Sack has good points there that it is true. The shamans were our leaders. The hunter is the leader. If you go to igloo or tent or now modern cabin, mother is looking after the children. She's the leader. So you know, colonial leadership is triangle, Inuit leadership is vice versa. So that's a difference, I think. But again, nowadays with modern government, government um, such as our Inuit organizations, they have their own individual leadership now. They may not be our elders, but they lead our Nunavut territory or in Inuit Sokam Polar Conference, there's a leader. So that represents all Inuit in Sokam Polar Arctic. So the, the leadership has shifted in time um, within just short time, 40 years, 60 years. Um, if we go out filming, Zach is my leader. But if I go out in a walk with my kids, I'm the leader. So it depends on the moment in time and what is happening in our culture. That's how I see leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy and, and Zacharias. Um, We've got about an hour left, and in the in the hour that comes, I'd like to open up the Eric. Eric, I'm sorry. Um, we, we our guests uh, only have until about eight o'clock. Um, oh, okay. I'm Zach sorry. and Lucy, I'm sorry. I apologize. Uh, so I was going to say we we have no comments that uh, people have put into the chat uh, that people want to ask. Uh, so I just wanted to turn the conversation over to Pauline, Jenny, and, and, and Simone uh, uh, in the meantime, while, you know, people perhaps think about uh, uh, comments that they're, uh, or questions that they have. So Pauline, Jenny, uh, Simone, do any of you have any uh, uh, additional questions or, or points that you'd like to make? I think I think for me the only other thing that we haven't really talked about in terms of this film and its space is, is space time. The fact that um, past, present, and future 
in this film sit in the same space at all times, like most Indigenous films, that there is, you know, it's an older story that's been handed down through the oral storyline, has a present component that is a part of, you know, understanding the law, understanding the culture of the country. Um, do you want to talk a little bit, I suppose, Zach, to that element of how does that, how, you know, the fact that it, it it's timeless in a way for other people when they look at it because of the fact that it sort of kind of encapsulates time to be current as well as past. Sorry, that's a very big question. <laughs> You know, in our film, at an object, time stood still for 4,000 years till we got into these fabric clothes and wooden houses. Time stood still. All the clothes were made the same. All the boots, sealskin boots, were sewn the same. Then the kayak, the way it was made, the dog team, how it was driven, left and right, stop and go, double speed. Uh, it's, these are timeless. The way they made the igloo, carving it in round, in like a dome, that's timeless. We don't know when it started. Uh, we still practice it uh, because uh, I, I, it's only <laughs> when Europeans came, everything started to change. Uh, now you have to have money uh, to eat. Uh, before that, you went to your uncle and he gave you the, the food you like. Uh, so it was like that. For me, time cha started changing when the whalers came, when they were hunting whale to light up the streets of London. Uh, so everything started to change. Uh, it's, we're learning. We're, we're now learning that the mining companies and oil companies, their old way of doing things. Just Still the same, they never change. Uh, so for us up here, uh, nothing really changed for thousands of years uh, until we heard about hell and Jesus and all, uh, and everything started to change. And how important was it for you to make sure that all the, for all the seasons um, were placed on the film. Sorry. <laughs> Pardon? How important was it for you to place all of the seasons that happen up north on the film? Lucy, can you answer that? Because it's given. I know Ligo Tamana, this is my. Upinga Awiya Ukiaksa Ukiolo Kano Ajileo Renakfe Takwa a Victor Sumadluti a jigging in a ragu iluan time differences. Davis Damon in in the Atanabia story, uh, we're following the story. We're following the story where it happened on this little island where Atanabja ran and he was hidden in seaweeds. That's a little island in the story. And we went to that little island and we filmed oh, yeah. there. Uh, we're following the story. Uh, so if it happened in the spring, it happened in the summer, we have to wait. Uh, uh, like I said, we took like a month off, two months off before the timing is right, and then we start shooting. Thank you, Zacharias. Uh, 
Uh, Russell has a question, so I'm going to turn things over to, to him since he has the control of the Zoom chat to begin with. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Eric. Um, and I know that Zach, you and Lucy uh, probably have to go soon, speaking of time. But this is just a quick question really coming out of um, what you were just saying in response to Pauline about um, the, the seasons and the shooting schedule. But uh, I have a, it's also a practical question. I've, I've always wondered about this. Before you got here, I showed a quick scene uh, from the film just to kind of remind everybody. Uh, I showed the scene where Oki tries to kill Atanar Jouad, but he leaps out of the tent and runs naked across the ice. And I've, we were watching it again, my wife and I, and we were thinking, how did they do that? I mean, how did you manage to film this guy running naked and barefoot across the ice? What, what was that all about in, you know, practical terms? In the story, I've heard about this story, uh, not only in one day, because I don't know that it's a bedtime story. We fell asleep a lot. I did along the story and I, I always picture that naked man running on the ice running for his life because we don't do that. We don't go out there, start running. The only time we run up here is when the whales are in the bay. So we're gonna hunt them. Um, I see this man running naked on the ice. And the way we shot it, uh, we were running out of time. Spring was, the ice was starting to break and we wanted to get this scene done. And Natar knew uh, since he plays the character that one day he's going to have to be naked. So, so this day was coming and the day came and mentally our actors are great because they got taught to act. Uh, to transform themselves to the character. And Natara was meditating, so he becomes Atanadjot. In the day, Atanadjot ran naked. Um, it was for uh, he, running for his life. Um, so the way we shot it, uh, it was different. Uh, we didn't have tracks to run our camera. So what we did was uh, uh, we put the camera on the sled and a whole bunch of us were running beside it. And we have Natar, the naked man running alongside the sled and back and forth. We shot this so many times. It worked and it just edited right. Uh, yeah. But there's downs and moments in the filming, but let me tell you, <laughs> I got mad once when I was directing only once. In the scene, when Atanan just escaped out on the ice, he ran out and the women are coming down. After egg picking, they're running down and they see their tent being demolished. And they're running down and, and they running down, and two women run down and one woman sees his husband dead and they're crying and everything, hell has broken loose. And we were watching this and our jaws are in the ground because it was so perfect. But my can my sound man had ran out of battery. <laughs> can you believe that? I was walking back and forth like a black robe priest, back and forth, back and forth, so mad. Um, people were sh trying to share cheer me up, and I could not believe it. But the movie magic made it happen. How many times did you fall off the sled? <laughs> um, we're just going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. 
to get up what filming does. And some of our actors, we put them on hold and because they're going to get on set and act today. And some of them would wait and wait and they don't get on. So their mind is somewhere fishing or hunting. And here they are wasting their time <laughs> waiting to get on the set. But that's from filming is, and everybody was working. Everybody was working. It'd be losing. What was that question again? Sorry. Oh, it was very specific to Natar, who couldn't make it here today, uh, unfortunately. Uh, it was just about the experience of, of having to run naked across the ice, which uh, still, I think, is one of the most amazing scenes in all of world cinema. And I'm not, I, I'm not exaggerating. Um, uh, I'm in, with respect to your character, Lucy. I'm stunned that Puya has become a grandmother. I have I have a hard time processing <laughs> that. Uh, but congratulations. Um, I don't know. I don't want to keep you guys longer than you can be here. Do you have time to take a question from the audience? Uh, I don't know if there are any, but it's up to you guys. There are a couple of questions from the from the audience. Um, hands or in the chat? In the, uh, in chat? the chat. Rachel, did you want to say anything? I see you have a a comment. Or not. No. Rachel wrote a nice uh, comment. And um, is there anyone Anyone in the audience who might want to pose a question uh, or comment to Lucy or Zach while, while they're here? Um, maybe I'll read Rachel's comment. It's the longest one we've received. I'm so inspired by the inclusive way of thinking that you shared, Lucy. You really impacted me when you said that, quote, we think we, the rest of the world thinks I. It's so important for governments and countries to learn to think in that way, valuing the community and especially with regards to the current environmental crisis. Thank you all so much for sharing. Uh, thank you, Rachel. That's a great comment. Um, I, I also want to add that uh, this uh, discussion and this celebration of Atanarjuat exceeded my wildest expectations. So I want to thank um, the panelists, the discussants, uh, Simone, Pauline, Jenny, and, and Eric, our moderator, um, I especially want to thank Lucy and Zach, Zacharias, of course, uh, for giving us their time today and especially for giving us this film. So thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you to everyone for coming out. And good night. Good night. And good morning to our Australian guests. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. The weather must Thank be you. hot over there. What's that? We're there. The yeah. weather must be hot in Australia. Yeah. Warming up, which is nice. <laughs> I suppose you're, you guys are probably heading into whale season, aren't you, Zach? You'd be getting close to heading into hunting season? Right, right now we're in the fall season, so I'm a little bit sick because of fever. <laughs> uh, so it's a uh, gray time of the year, snowing, freezing up. Nice. Hmm. Well, hopefully I'll see you all in um, Canada or Imaginative or you come down here. We, I know we've talked about that, Zach, trying to get you to come and hunt a couple of kangaroos. <laughs> um, I know it takes a long time to get down this way, but thank you for, thank you for allowing us to be a part of yeah. your day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank, thank you, Pauline. This is your 22nd anniversary for Imaginative. So I remember 2001 bringing Zach down. It was awesome. And the other thing I was going to say about that foot running thing, I remember when they did the, they showed the um, feet. 
they had it on display at Imaginative, the feet that he wore, that Nadar wore. It was mm-hmm. like, and I was like, oh, of course the, that you would have to look after his feet <laughs> because he was running on the high. Because <laughs> I was trying to figure out what were his, how could he run so much, so many times mm-hmm. in takes? And then I saw the feet, the, mm. yeah. And then I was like, ah, there, he was wearing feet within his feet so he could run on ice. <laughs> so it was like the Hobbits right, and the Lord of the Rings. Yeah, <laughs> secrets of the trade. Hey, mom. They got their ideas from us. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> totally. They were learning from the film too. Learning from the best. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Hey, bye, bye. Yeah, Thank bye. you. Thank you for coming. Good to see everyone. Have a good night. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Hey. Or good, good night. morning. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Simone. Thank you. I should know um, that for anybody who's uh, uh, interested in seeing how this, how the film at Narjawat has a, uh, uh, as somebody said, is simultaneously in the past, future, and and, and present at the at the same time. Uh, you should watch the Spanish translation, which is what I had to watch uh, the other day because I couldn't find my personal copy of the of the film. And they have done the translation so that uh, when you see the translation for the second half of the film, they're just repeating the translation for the first half of the film, but it amazingly fits what's actually going on. So they'll be talking about a character in the first half of the film, but it's the second half of the film, and it's it's like a memory of what's happening. It's it's completely bizarre. You know, it could not be that they that they planned this intentionally, but it's but it's showing how well timed the film was, so that the second half was sort of repeating the lessons learned in the first half, and it's pretty amazing to 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 see it. <laughs> How strange. So it was subtitled in Spanish. It was sub- there's a there's a version that is accessible online that is subtitled in Spanish. As long uh, as it's not dubbed, that would just be that would be horrible. No, no, it, 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 sorry, it's it's <laughs> it's subtitled in 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 Spanish. You can also right. read the English subtitles, but if you understand the 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 Spanish ones, you just notice that they didn't subtitle. They they, they gave uh, the wrong translation for the second half. They just uh, put this first half there yeah. so you can be reading the the spanish and it actually works as the memories that people are recalling as the events are taking place uh in the second half and it's it's a very bizarre yeah. experience <laughs> yeah subtitles are these films have absolutely minimal subtitles and there are many scenes in all their films that are unsubtitled, right? Where people are just talking and the non nook speaking viewer has no idea what they're talking about and they don't care. Um, I think it's great. <laughs> speaking of, you know, universality. Um, it's recorded, so we will, we've kept good to know, I think. Um, I'll, I'll um, uh, write to you guys, the panelists, especially uh, tomorrow to uh, just uh, touch base and thank you again. Um, and also Zach and Lucy. Um, I, I, I really, I'm really grateful. I think it, it went really well. And, and you're, you're, Eric, you, you, you were a fantastic moderator, uh, by the way. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you for lying so graciously. No, no I mean, I, you, I, were, I, Eric. <laughs> you were perfect. <laughs> really perfect. Job. Yeah. 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 So. And, and thanks again to you guys for, for showing up and uh, uh, lingering. Um, <laughs>